Well, hello, lovely listeners. Um, Today I get to chat to the wonderful Corbin Elliott. Corbin has his own podcast show um, called The Peace and Purpose Podcast, which is a great name. Um, Corbin has also written a book called Unconventional Anxious to Alive. And Corbin's only only young. How old are you, Corbin? I'm 24. 24, just an absolute baby. Um, And but he's very passionate about helping young adults, showing them how to get clear on exactly who they are and what they want. Um, And there are also tools that you can give them as well. And uh, you call it life design. And it works because decisions get really easy when people get completely clear about who they are and what they want. And I completely, completely agree with that. I'm a life purpose coach myself in the work the work that I take people through is really understanding to the core of who they are and how how they've evolved as that. And when you know that, then you know the vision of, of what your future, you know, what you actually want your future to be, not falling into a career that sort of pays the bills and all the rest of it. Um, it's life changing. If you can live from purpose and live from who you actually are, then you're going to be such a, a much happier person. So welcome Corbin it's a pleasure to have you um and uh yeah I can't wait uh, for the listeners to hear more about you well thanks for having me Mel yeah I you're right I'm totally passionate about this thing I I think the reason I'm so passionate about it is because you know what I've my experience I guess being a young person trying to figure out what what I want why I want it all of those different things um so yeah, I'm certainly passionate about it. So a little bit about me. I'll just give you a starter, a starter pack on myself. Um, I so I came up. I was always a, uh, a performer. I was a musician, um, a singer more specifically, and ah, I did this all too. through high school. Do what? Uh, me too. I'm a singer as well. I got you. Um, <laughs> so anyway, I did this all through high school. I did it continue to pursue it in college. I mean, it was going very well. I was um, touring internationally. Like, things were things were looking up. Nice. Um, but but the problem was, <laughs> before we, yeah, I appreciate it, before we start nice and too much here, is that um, I got to a point in college where I just, I didn't have the fortitude to stick with what I knew I wanted to do, which was which was music. Uh, I think a lot of the things that you know come in, they say you know it's impractical or it's uh, or it's not as safe or it's it's all these different things, regardless. Um, and whether those voices were loud or quiet, in my head I was building them up to really be something. Um, and as a result, I took a I took a left hand turn, like a like a a 365 degree turn and I started pursuing things that were more practical in my mind. This is what I've I've discovered after the fact. So I started I was like, "Oh, I'm going to be, you know, be a personal trainer, work at the gym, uh, I'm going to be a doctor. These are all things that I'm I'm continuing to to change from, to change from in, in my course of study. Um, to be a doctor, to to start a business, be an entrepreneur, to um, to a doctor, and then finally back to music. And and the reason that all this evolution happened is, uh, or at least from doctor on, I started to really follow my passion again um, because I got to a turning point where I was very anxious, and I think the anxiety came from, it came from the fact that I knew that I didn't want to do what I was doing, but I was doing it anyway, and I didn't want to admit it to myself um, because of all the, you know, it wasn't safe and all these things, and it's like if I had to admit it to myself, I would then have to face it and have to do something about it, but I didn't want to do that, so it got to the point where, I mean, I was getting pent up, so it was anxious mind and then slowly anxious body, so I had the the psychosomatic symptoms of, of anxiety, so had back tension, um, chest tension, and then slowly got, like, I started having muscle spasms. I started, it was, it was terrible at one point. Um, I spent a whole week in bed, like, it it was, it was nasty. I couldn't get up, and I couldn't even leave the, leave the bed physically for a week. And this was at probably 22, going on 23, probably somewhere in between there. Um, And 
I'm like, I'm I'm 22. I, I'm going. I can't even get up and go to the bathroom on my own. Like something's something's wrong here. Uh, and uh, at that point, I sort of didn't. My body didn't give me an option but to to change paths. Um, so I turned back around, sort of have slowly navigated my way back out, and now I'm, I'm doing the things that I think I'll be happy of whenever I'm 80, uh, as opposed to the things that I'll be able to tell people at a cocktail party. So that's a little <laughs> bit about me. So did you go to um, college and get your degree and all of that? I did, yeah. So I ended up, I came out, surprisingly, with, I did have a, uh, a vocal performance degree. So I, I did end up, I did, know, did end up graduating with that. Um, had a minor in entrepreneurship, which it actually still helps me because there's a lot of elements in that with what I do now. Um, and I took a bunch of pre-med classes, but there's no degree for that. So, <laughs> <laughs> so um, you said you toured internationally with the singing. Um, so what, what, yeah. sort of, what sort of um, music are you into? What sort of singing do you do? So what I did internationally was varied. So I do anything from classical to literally the poppiest pop music you've ever heard. Uh, so <laughs> um, I did some time in Costa Rica. So they have like these cultural centers down there. Um, and they don't do much musical theater, but I, we essentially brought like a, like a cabaret show of like a mix of musical theater and, uh, performed at a bunch of cultural centers in Costa Rica. That was super fun. Mm. Um, did a lot of, I was mainly in Europe, uh, which is where there was like some, some spiritual, some gospel music, um, some more contemporary music too over there, but doing that for tours. Uh, I sang at the Vatican one year. That was great, super cool nice. at a at a mass. Um, and that was that was gospel spiritual music. Uh, there's a there's a um, institute of music that is actually an American institute of music, but it's the the most prolific one in Europe. And I uh, sang sang with them as well. So so that was. Uh, classical but also more um jazz all, all the different styles essentially so so i've done a lot of different genres and are you still singing now or is it more of a sideline or front line again uh like that you know it's been the continuation of me figuring out what i wanted to do so post-college i've slowly fell back into it so like i'm teaching voice lessons now again um i am actually a auditioning currently to, to go on cruise ships and, and be a contractor for cruise ships to, to uh, perform on cruise ships. Um, so I'm doing I'm doing things that's really becoming the front line, especially with uh, with the voice lessons and, and those contracts. So so yeah, it's actually turning back into that again. So so yeah, that that's actually my main hustle now, surprise. <laughs> oh, okay, okay. So why cruise liners? Is it because you get to travel as well or is it what 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 make sure yeah. on those yeah get to travel a lot um i found that i grew up a lot when i traveled so that's that that's a cool part second part is unlike anything that you do on the land um well you well one your salary which is not uncommon on the land if you're in a show for a while but um the second part is they pay for all of your living expenses and then you have a salary so that's great um as a guy getting on his feet essentially with this stuff um, but yeah, I get to travel, meeting new people. Um, I'm looking for an adventure. Uh, I'm 24. I'm single. I'm ready to go out and do my thing. Um, so, so yeah, so that's, that's sort of, that's my, where my head's at with that. Yeah. Don't blame you. Bloody hell. Uh, I wish I'd done that, but, um, yeah. Um, so in terms of you were bed bound for a week and your body was, doing all sorts of weird and wonderful things and and painful by the sounds of it so what what happened after that you know in terms of you were able to get mobile again um and obviously the anxiety had sort of reached uh, an unbearable uh level by the sounds of it what what sort of happened next and and i guess this experience was what sort of made the podcast and the, and the book arrive um so yeah, it was. Talk, talk us through how you went from being bed bound to to getting to where you've got to. Sure. Yeah. No. The 
the podcast, the book, everything I've done in this realm is in response to my experience with that. So, so yeah. Um, so how I walked my way out, I, I think that's one in the bed. It's taking the realization and I think admitting to myself a little bit that I, I knew what I needed to be doing and I wasn't doing it. Um, I think I sort of had a had a um, a come to Corbin meeting in in the bed there. Um, so, and moving out of that, it was a matter of figuring out, okay, what do I want? Like, like what do I really want realistically with my life, especially right at this point? But long term, and what do I need to do now to where that sets that up? Um, and that's difficult because for the, I mean, I had a very clear path. I knew what I was doing uh, initially. You know, throughout my, throughout my entire life up until, I guess it was my coming on my junior year of college, going into my junior year, I had always knew what I wanted to do. I was going to be a musician. That was what was going to happen. Uh, and then for there to be such a sociological element that would knock me off that path, I knew that it was going to be very difficult to to find what I wanted to do again um, from from there since I had I wasn't on that path hard charging path forward um so what i really did is just little and i shared these with people little exercises to figure out again what actually made me happy during the day what things were what things would bring me joy and then sort of reverse engineering my life to where i can make the time that i spend in joy more than than not more than mundane things so that's that's how i sort of navigated after out of that after that bedridden moment of uh, difficulty. So yeah. So you had you, you basically had a lot of time to reflect and um, <clears throat> have some divine inspiration almost. Um, yeah. So when you, you when you got mobile again, um, how, how, how just talk us through how it actually looked in terms of one minute you're feeling overwhelmed and you know you're realizing you're not exactly following the path that maybe you should be following or you or you or you truly want to follow um why a podcast and and then why a book you know how did all of it that sort of come to you yeah well it was slow um every, everything was happening like in slow motion this was not a quick process it was very much uh all right how do i get through today and sort of be at some level of peace with myself um and especially right out of the bed it was very much like all right i got into meditation i got into journaling i got into all these things that i that i use now to orient myself and it was very slow the podcast came about from just me going, okay, because I had a friend actually started it with another guy, um, and you know we we started out of the premise of we're talking about stuff that is not generally talked about among young people. Generally, it's a lot of surface level conversation, even among friends. Generally, a lot of surface level, who's doing what, did they get married, whatever um, going on uh, in in young people. So the the podcast was started out of the premise of talking about the actual, the ugly side or the challenging side of being a young person and sort of getting that message out there to more people because if I had that, you know, if I had a presence like I guess I'm having on the internet now, if I had a list, if I was listening to someone like myself, I would have done a lot better through that time period of, uh, I, I really feel terrible. How am I going to get out of this? Um, so that's re really why I started the podcast when I was on the up and up out of that, and that's why I started it to be to be that guy who could could be the voice of hey it's gonna be okay I know you can't see over this over this mountain right now because you know that seems seems to be what happens in life but here I am I'm living proof that you can you can sort of succumb it or overcome it. So why do you think um, it's, it's interesting because I've got a 22 year old son. And he's suffered with anxiety on and off, I would say, probably since he was about 16, 17, maybe. Now, it doesn't, not to the level where it debilitates him, because he's, he's I mean, he's recently moved off up to Manchester, which is a different city to where we live. He's, he's living in a, the city life in an apartment, sharing it with his buddy, um, you know, and that's something he always wanted to do good on him 
Um, but I think the last couple of years, I mean, he works for Google as well. And that was something, you know, he never went to university. It wasn't something that he wanted to do. Um, and I always, I always say with Jake, he will fall in shit and come up smelling of roses because he's so chilled. Things just seem to happen, you know? And, and I think, and I think, I think because he's had that experience a lot, when stuff gets a bit tough, um, it hits him harder than maybe somebody like myself. I've had to work hard and hustle ever since I was a kid. Do you know what I mean? And sure. So I'm, I'm interested to know your perspective on why so many more younger people seem to be suffering with things like anxiety and depression and you know, suicides in university, especially, seem to be higher. And I know, su I know, suicide as a rule has increased through the pandemic, um, for lots of different people, um, not just the young people. But yeah, just keen to know what your perspective is from from a young lad, you know, growing up in whereabouts in America are you? I'm. If you throw it, so the I'm in the state of North Carolina. And if you throw a dart it's at North Carolina, I'm the bullseye. So that, okay. that's the best way I like to explain it to people. Cool, right. Um, yeah, so anxiety. It, it's it's very interesting. And, and why, the, the question of why it happens more, or it seems to happen more now, mm. I, I don't know. I don't know if whether it's a reporting thing. I mean, I'm just spitballing here. It could be a reporting thing as far as... Um, you know, we didn't look for it as much, or we didn't have the name anxiety, you know, in the 80s or the 70s, or, you know, sometime before the, the current the current day. Um, as I know, that happens a lot in medicine, as far yeah. as, oh, this is this thing we now look for, or, yeah, yeah. or, and then, you know, even in the medical community, even if it is something that's diagnosed, and that gets on the internet, and people have access to it now, um, and they can say, oh, I, I have anxiety, that's what I'm, that's what I'm feeling right now. Or, or whatever. Um, so I think that could be a component. I think also a component, there's a, and I don't, this has probably been here for forever, but there's always a pressure to be someone, I guess, as opposed to, we're all, I think we're all gaming for status, which maybe that's a part of happiness, but I think we're all gaming for status more than we are for being happy. Um, and I, I think that that is a problem. Um, and anxiety, whenever we fall short of being this thing that we're supposed to be, then I think we get anxious because then we're like, oh, okay, maybe I'm not worth, I'm not worth anything, and, and people aren't going to like me, or or all these different things. Because especially as young people, we really care about what people think of us. Generally, generally, um, I've sort of been ironing that out of myself, but it's built in because um, it matters, you know, from an evolutionary standpoint, it matters that we are accepted by people. Um, so. I think a big component of it is it's like there are these archetypes now that we we want to be one of those things, and if we're if we're not one of those things, then we're less than, and people really don't want to be less than in the eyes of others, especially their peer group. Um, so I think anxiety runs rampant whenever we don't, you know, if you're not a CEO or if you're not some famous thing or if you're not the the hit in the culture, um, it makes you feel less than and then you feel like that'll just from a an old brain standpoint if we don't fit in socially bad things tend to happen to us um so i think a lot of uh, I think it's not a coincidence that in the in the teenage years anxiety is really rampant it happens again in young adulthood because you're really navigating what what the rest of your life's going to look like um but as a teenager that's whenever that's the first time that you're really noticing how important the peer group is. I mean, you can notice it younger, but this is the this is the heart of it. Um, there's no coincidence that that's when anxiety peaks. So, so yeah, that, that's a little bit of my take on it, I guess. Yeah, it makes sense. I, I remember. Um, by the way, I don't know if you want to switch your video off because you've frozen and there was a bit of um, a bit of yeah, lag. That sounds good. Um, uh, it's all right, Corbin's just having some uh, Wi-Fi issues today. So, um, 
Yeah, I mean, the teenager thing, for sure, you know, um, we all feel like that. The hormones are running riot and it's affecting the way we think about things and feel things and all of that. And uh, and all of a sudden, you know, you're questioning everything. You go from being a child to this teenager and you're like, Jesus Christ, what the hell's going on? You know, I remember um, I got it into my head that I was adopted I'm not, I'm not adopted. I'm one of four kids, you know, we, we were not adopted, but you know, it's just crazy stuff that goes through your head uh, in those, in those years. But I don't know, it just seems, it seems to me, and maybe it's because I'm too far away from it now, but it seems to me that the, the younger generation, um, certainly people your age are seem to be suffering more with stress and anxiety than I remember it being when I was that age. Um, but I, I like what you said, you know, there are more, these labels are more readily available and slapped on things so quickly, you know, and then all of a sudden everybody's got depression or everybody's got anxiety and it's like, I hate, I hate labels, <clears throat> you know, everybody's different. Um, and just because you're feeling down one day does not mean you've got depression. So, so yeah, right. um, so, so when you um what what was it that was creating that for you do you know was it just the fact that you were like oh i'm on the wrong path and i, I should be on this path and people have told me this path isn't going to work and i and i was going to do this and i was going to do that and was it that whole sort of confusion of what you should or shouldn't be doing that sort of got you into that state do you think yeah uh well, i mean there was a there's the component that runs parallel to that of I expect very much, I expect a lot from myself. Mm -hmm. And I think the continuous cycle of starting over in a different thing makes me feel like I'm progressing less. Um, I'm just sort of casting my net very wide. And uh, I think that that was probably provoking some level of stress on me as well. Um, so I think, I think that's a part of it that runs parallel. Yeah. Uh, also just some... I don't know, probably just the culture of being a, being, a spe this got, it got worse whenever I, just whenever I graduated. So I think also the, the stress of being a post-grad, but you're basically taking that and multiplying it by the, the two things that I mentioned before. Um, so I, I'd say a really intense case of being unclear. And I think being unclear is probably the most stress-provoking thing ever because it's, the, the future is extremely uncertain at that point mm. to the point to it to a fault like sometimes that can be great and it's oh it's exciting what's going to happen but this it just got my and my brain could not predict what was going to happen next um and i think that was a big piece do you think also because it that what you just said there it has reminded me about a couple of things so one of previous podcast podcast um guest she said that when being spat out at the other end of university when up until that point you're in uh, structures and establishments and you know what you're doing and you're re revising for your A-levels and then you're doing your degree and then maybe you'll do a postgrad or whatever, um, <clears throat> you've got a structure and you know what you're doing day to day and you've got a timetable. When you get spat out at the other end, all of a sudden you've got all of this, oh, right, now what? You know, And there is that pressure of, I should know what I want to do by now. Um, and of course, most people don't. But it, also, a friend of mine who was in the military had uh, had the same thing. Because when you're in the military, it's all structured. You know, <clears throat> you're given your accommodation. You've got your team. You might be the officer in charge, but there's a structure. And then all of a sudden, when you decide to leave the military for whatever reason, you're out in civvy land, as they call it, and there is no structure. And all of a sudden, you've got to think for yourself and start start trying to understand what it is you do want to do with your life outside of that structure so do you think there's an element um of truth in that yeah i think it's a great point i i think yeah the you're sort of on your own to to make guiding decisions to make the executive decisions well in in college yeah sure you do that you know like you're you're making decisions the ideas in preparation for you to to make career choices later on 
and you know relationship choices and all these other things that are going on in college. So sure, you're making decisions, but the structure, like you mentioned, it it alters. It, essentially, it drops out and says goodbye. Um, yeah. You know, especially whenever you've been in school your entire life. So I think I think so. I think you make a great point to that, um, and that part of the process is figuring out how to create your own structure in life or how you're going to manage yourself and, and all these other things, um, which is a big part of it. And one thing that really helped me was was accepting and I think coming to terms with the fact that it just takes time and sometimes processes are just a little painful and a little uncomfortable and being able to being able to work with that under the premise of, hey, I know it, it's really rough right now, but but there's a timeline here. And at the end of the timeline, things are going to resolve themselves. So I think I think having that as your as your shining light in a situation where you're really trying to adjust is helpful. Yeah, you you just said something that that makes perfect sense. You've just said something that made me think. Um, we all know that life certainly over the last five years um, has got worse. It's that instant gratification with anything, whether it be the TikTok video, whether it be Amazon um, delivered tomorrow or even delivered today, um, it's that instant gratification that, 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 well, my age, we've come to get used to and and I will use um, use those services as and when I need to myself. But for, for somebody your age, it's kind of, you know, like the... The internet and, and computers wasn't really a thing when I was a kid. Um, I had my first mobile phone at the age of 23. And my son had a mobile phone at the age of nine, um, which I didn't want to do, but I did because everybody else was doing it, you know. Um, right. And it's crazy because you, you've become so reliant on these damn things from such a young age, whereas, you know, for me, I didn't even have a television in my room till I was 18 you know um so it's a, it's a whole different ball game um so this instant gratification that you as your generation have are just used to it's just how life's been when you are not when you are not able to give yourself instant gratification for whatever that career choice might be or you're looking for that happiness or that fulfillment and nine times out of ten we're all looking in the wrong places because that flash car it might make you feel better and make you feel good for a month at the most and then at that point you realize nobody else gives a shit that you're driving that flash car and it gets you from a to b and yeah it's a nice ride and it looks great but i still feel like shit on the inside so you know looking for those externals to give you that pleasure is very very short-lived and um, and because we've because we're on in this instant gratification model for, for want of a better phrase, when you're not getting that personally, individually, you know, why don't I, why am I not in this hundred thousand pound job straight from university, you know? And it's because that's what you see on social media, all this fakeness people are putting on how amazing their lives are through photographs that probably aren't genuine in lots of cases. Um, so yeah, so I just wanted to pick up on that. You mentioned about the the instant thing and I thought, yeah, you know, for your generation, that's what you've grown up being used to. And when, when things aren't instant for you personally, then it's gonna hit harder than it would for somebody like me. Right, right. No, I think I can, I can see the culture there, the underlying culture. And I'm also just noticing, even with the instantness of things, like what things I'm I'm really curious about this too. Like what things really make people feel good, like sustainably. Like like that that's the biggest interest for me in my life because I I really see that as being is is the game we're all playing. It's the do we feel do we emotionally do we have positive feelings more or do we have negative feelings more? Like and and what how can we bring about sustainable positive feelings like I think if we can crack that code then 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 we're on the we're about to take a victory lap because well I'm there it's pretty nice <laughs> I, I think if you can crack that code you're probably going to be relabeled as God <laughs> that's fair <laughs> that's fair um but you know 
and th- and that's why I spend a lot of my time looking at um like here here here's an exercise I did to get myself you know reorient myself I call it the joy journal and it's something you do I did it every day for 30 days I don't walk people into that but essentially at the end of the day I write down the parts of my day that genuinely made me feel good or made me the happiest and I write down those parts of the day and then I do that for 30 days and then at the end of the 30 days I'll go back and read through the journals and I'll I'll look for patterns. So that's really my personal case study of what where happiness comes from, at least for me. Um, and that's what I suggest people doing because we're really taking the guesswork out of it. It's like, okay, this made me happy. This didn't make me happy. Let's try to do more happy stuff. Yeah. Um, as a as a as a uh, you know, it 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 keeps it from. It's like a guess and check game. And it's more reliable, I think, than sort of playing the "oh, this sounds nice" uh, thing. It's it's a little bit more fundamental and practical. Yeah, um, I totally get that. You know, the journaling side of things is something I wish I did. I did more. Um, I've done it from time to time. Um, used to keep a gratitude journal, that sort of thing. The secret. Um, I don't know if you've ever read it or saw seen the DVD, um, but that came out crikey. 12, 13 years ago, maybe a bit more, can't somewhere around there. And and even though that for me is now quite basic in terms of um, like the law of attraction and all the rest of it, I'm a very spiritual person. It, it opened it up to the masses. And I've seen a massive change in the last 10 years in terms of just the language people are saying, you know, most, most people now are talking about the universe. That didn't happen, you know, five, 10 years ago. Um, a lot of people are talking about, you know, being able to track the right things to them. That that kind of language wasn't around either. So I don't know if you've looked at The Secret or read The Secret, but if you haven't, it's worth worth um, some of your time. Um, and in terms of the, the big misconception, I think, is you've got to find happiness. You've got to find your inner happiness. Well, it's, it's, you don't have to find it, it's there. Um, right. And and it's also, what does happiness mean? Well, happiness doesn't doesn't have to mean, like, you know, shoulder-shaking laughter 24 hours a day. That is not happiness. Happiness is being, is being content, is being okay with where you are at right now because it might not be where you've seen your mate on social media. It might not be the movie that you watched last night where, you know, everything was just unbelievable and the guy was a millionaire by the age of 25 or whatever. That is, you know, everybody's life is different. We're all on this planet to to do our own journey. And my belief is that journey is to evolve and have an impact on your immediate environment and immediate people and they have an impact and they have an impact and so on and so on. You Have you heard of the butterfly effect? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Very familiar. Cool. So, so in terms of everybody's at their, at whatever level they're at and nothing's right and nothing's wrong, where we all get so pissed off, depressed, suicidal and all the rest of it is because we're not where we think we should be. You know, we've been a disappointment. We didn't do, we didn't take the path our parents wanted for us. We ended up, you know, in trouble along the way. We we took wrong decisions. Well, all of that, even though it's not the golden, oh yes, this is what I want, you know, and, and guess what? There is no destination. Your journey is gonna change all the time. Um, if we can be happy with where we're at right now, and by the way, I'm guilty, massively guilty of what I'm talking about, which is why I talk about it with such passion. I was going to be a millionaire by the time I was 30. It didn't happen. Um, you know, so I I totally get it. Um, I've always been very ambitious. And more. I lost my dad in 2006, and that really catapulted my spiritual journey. And, and along the way, you know, I've come to certain realizations and one of them is you've got to be okay with where you're at. 
even if the bank balance is crap and all the rest of it, it doesn't matter because what matters is how you're growing as a person, how you're evolving, how your consciousness is evolving, what impact you're having on the people around you. You want it to be positive. You don't want it to be negative. You want to be empowering people. You want to be uplifting people. Um, you don't want to be drowning in your own self-pity for not having achieved that 100,000 this year or whatever it might be. Um, and that is easier said than done um, massively because society around us is telling us the complete opposite. Um, right. But if you can step away from what society is telling you you should or shouldn't be doing and you can stand strong in who you are as a person um, and Corbin, I mean, I can't see you at the moment, which is a, is a bit frustrating for me because I love to um, converse, you know, over video. Yes, same. Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, but I can already tell, you know, at such a young age, the the man that you, you're becoming anyway in terms of it isn't about the quick fix. You're looking for more than that. You're looking for purpose. You're looking, you want that inner joy um, regardless of what car you drive or what house you live in or whatever. Um, and being a singer, um, obviously that gives you a lot of joy and the creativity and that that is coming from you. That is you. Anyway, I've talked, I've waffled on. Yeah. There, but, um, I just felt the need to share because, uh, probably because you're a similar age to my son as well. And my son, as much as he likes to take the piss out of me at times, he does... <laughs> He does value, you know, what I have to say. Um, and yeah, so over to you. Yeah, <laughs> and, and that's a fun thing, I think, about being on other people's podcasts, though. You get to hear the, you get to hear a lot of perspective. And I, th I think perspective's gold, um, you know, regardless of, you know, who the person is or, or where they're from or anything. But uh, yeah, no, I can definitely see that. The tendency, that's the, yeah, that's the curious part about it because, even as a person like like myself, who I you know I appreciate you saying those things you know about you know just something sustainable and not the not the quick fix and all this stuff. The tendency, though, you know, if I'm not paying attention, that there there tend at some point there's a reversion back to okay these things you know that, and I'm really curious about that tendency why it's there or you know whether it's all society telling us or whether it's a human tendency that isn't. You know, because because our brain isn't designed to make us happy. Our brain's designed to help us survive. <laughs> at the end of the day, yeah. um, so I'm I'm like you know I'm really curious, and and believe me, everybody will know if I if I crack the code on this guy because <laughs> if I can figure out the tendency on this, that's going to be huge because that's the thing. Even if you even if you have the mindset that I do about these, and I think about things a little bit differently than a lot of young people, but. Um, even I have the tendency to, to fall back into it. So I'm like, if I can crack that code for people, I'll be excited. Um, so, but yeah, there, there's a fallback into the, into the, the status update world. I would say, regardless of whether you're literally doing that on social media or in your mind of, oh man, look at me. I'm, I, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm significant or I matter. I think, I think we all want that reverting back to that, but I think we need to alter the definition of of what matters. Like you don't you don't have to be the CEO of some company to to matter, or you don't have to be anything. You could just be a mom and and matter, you know, as opposed to as opposed to doing all these these other things and, and redefining that. So yeah, I yeah, know I appreciate your perspective though. Yeah, and I think the other thing is, you know, this this you know what you're searching for it will come with experience and it will come with um new opportunities we we can't figure it all out at the age of 17 or 24 or 30 or we still haven't figured it out probably by the time we get to 80 however we will have figured out a lot more by the time we've got to 80 and hopefully um we will be more content in our own skin and and put what's really important as a priority, as opposed to, you know, you've probably heard it yourself. The people that are are on their deathbeds are not saying, I wish I spent more time in the office. They're saying, right. they're saying the complete opposite. And if we can take that perspective in our everyday life, 
so many people beat themselves up about um, not working hard enough or they need to be in the office. They need to be the last one in the office. They need this. They need to do this. They need to do that to prove that they're working hard, to prove that they are uh, valued. And again, it's all the external stuff. Um, you don't get to knowing how, how can I put it? You don't get to being strong in who you are um, generally in your 20s because there's still a lot of learning. There's still a lot of um, new experiences, um, new people, weird people, great people. Um, you know, you're going to get on this cruise ship and you're going to, your world's going to change again. You know, you're going to meet all of these weird and wonderful people. You're going to see all these amazing places. And, um, and each one of those things is going to change you forever, whether it be in a big way or a small way. So that, that is going to continually evolve throughout your life. And so I get why you want to find these tendencies, but it, it, it's different for everybody because, you know, somebody, if, if you said to somebody, another 24 year old, oh, go on the cruise ships and, and be an entertainer, that would be horrific, you know, because everybody is <laughs> so different, right? right. Um, and you can only get your perspective and it is only your perspective and it is only my perspective from my experiences, which are completely different to everybody else's. And even if I had the same experience with a mate and we lived the same thing, her or his perspective is going to be wildly different to mine. And we lived the same experience. Right. So, do you know what I mean? So it's... Yeah. No, a compilation of their other experiences helps to... Uh, yeah. I cha change the lens at which they look through thing look at things through. Yeah, no, I... I completely with you. I think I'm really curious about the, I guess, the more fundamental things of what people tend to make people happy, if that makes sense. Like, like you know, I understand there's, there's idiosyncrasies between people, but like, you know, a relationship where you can talk about things with, with the, with your partner. I'm like, you know, I, I'm, I'm really curious about noticing patterns, but within myself and then sort of feeding back Mm. here's how I relate and what my podcast is about. I give people tools to figure out themselves as opposed to telling them who they are, if yeah. that makes sense. Yeah. So so I definitely concur in that department. Um, uh, but yeah, no, actually, that's very funny that you say that because I actually had a friend who I was like, hey, because he, he's an actor. And I was like, hey, you want to do this cruise ship thing with me? And he was, he was like, no, not at all. So it's a completely, we'll feed into that example. Yeah, there you go. So when did you, um, so this book that you've written, remind, remind us what it's called? Yeah, it's called uh, Unconventional Anxious to Alive. Uh, okay. and, and that's based off of the idea that um, I am just very, I have a very different approach than, than pretty much everybody else I know. Um, that's why I call it unconventional. And that, the pro, that approach developed from on the recovery process of me being less anxious, essentially. Um, mm. And I, I, sort of sh I sort of share the the tools that I used in the book to, I guess, formulate that approach. So, so that's, that's what it's about, navigating out of anxiety back into, oh, I'm actually feeling good again. So, so that, that's the premise of the book. And how can people get hold of it? Uh, it's on Amazon, so that, that's really the best place to find it. Um, as you know, a lot of things are on Amazon now, but um, but that's the place. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Um. Well, Corbin, it's been uh, it's been lovely to to chat with you, even though we're not on video right now. But um, I'm always always intrigued especially by the younger generation and and obviously I've got an affinity to um younger guys in in as much as Jake's 22 and I I see the journey that he's been on I'm always intrigued to see how young people evolve adapt how they how they want to live their life so it's been a real um interesting uh hour for me to just listen to your perspective and and as I said to you earlier, you know, it's, I guess, maybe hitting rock bottom in terms of not being able to leave your bed for a week is a, is a massive deal um, uh, at a young age. But 
you could have like gone, you know, you could have cried the whole time and gone, where is me, where is me? But what you actually did was you had perspective. You gave yourself that space to think about things differently and 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 maybe take divine inspiration. Um, and then you wanted to help other people. You wanted to serve other people. And I meant to say this earlier, and, and it's obviously now coming up now for the right reasons. In terms of that inner happiness, that inner whatever that, that we're all wanting to have all the time, when you serve others um, and help other people, that's that's it. Yeah, no, that's what I've found. Any anything, even with my goals, the way I frame things, whether it's whether it's music um, or it's or it's the podcast or whatever I'm doing, um, it is always framed in as far as what I want my people say. What do you want your legacy to be, or you know, what do you want people to say about you? I guess it's it's framed in that manner. It's essentially helping people to have have a positive experience through whatever talent or skill it is of my own. So, so I definitely relate with that. Yeah, exactly. And I, I think that you're going to continue to want to serve and help. And I mean, you'll be doing that with the cruise ship stuff because people love to be entertained, right? And and it's an opportunity. For, oh, one hundred percent. Yeah, and it's an opportunity for you to be able to express yourself in that way. Um, but I can I can see you probably ending up being a coach at some point. I'm I'm just going to put that out there. Um, <laughs> throw that out into the universe <laughs> <laughs> so if people want to find out more about corbin um where's the best place for them to go the best place if you search the peace and purpose podcast anywhere yeah. really like if you just google it we're i think we're the whole front page or at least 99 percent of it so um if you look there that's what it is the peace and purpose podcast we're freshly on youtube so i've been trying my my hand at videography um oh. but it's 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 the podcast but it's there are visual elements to it so i've got uh you get to see my lovely face as you couldn't for the whole podcast on this um you get to see my lovely face uh there's some uh some b-roll that really illustrates what I'm talking about, I guess, more, but then there's also the audio version. So if you look up the Peace and Purpose podcast, we're, we're that. Perfect. And, and I always like to close these interviews down with um, anything you feel called to share with the listeners, um, any pearls of wisdom, anything at all. Yeah, I would just say um, if you're in a bad place, or, you know, you're not feeling you know, well, or things have been tough in your life. I think, and this is more, this is difficult, but the, the, the patience, if you have patience, it does get better. Um, there, there is a, there is a good part of this. And even as a, even as a young guy, and I now understand the context of a valley. And I think if you can understand, even if, it, even if you haven't been through a big valley yet, or if you have, um, that you can't when you're at the bottom it's hard to see and things are unclear about whether it's going to get better or not but you can even if you haven't been through one you can take the context of me um that it does get better i'm telling you the worst valley of my life over probably a three or four year period um and i'm i'm starting to come out of it so just having the patience and fortitude if you can do that things do get better that that would be my just my ending comment very very sage advice thank you um thank you corbin it's been a pleasure to to meet you and listen to some of your story it's only just beginning i'm sure you're going to do amazing things um but thank you and i know the listeners will have loved this too all right well thank you so much thanks for having me mel you're very welcome <laughs>